but uh, I I really enjoyed your work generally on on courage. Uh, my interest in courage came actually uh, two reasons. One from Barbara. Uh, Barbara taught me courage, and uh, the other one is a chime to with my uh, interest in German idealism, mm -hmm. uh, Kant and Schelling and Fichte and all mm -hmm. these people, Schelling in particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I should say we, we dealt with the poetry more than the philosophy, but we, yes. you can't help touching on the philosophy. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I don't want to take more of your time because we've got two hours. Mm. I leave it to you, Peter, if you don't thank mind. You. And thank you very much for joining us all the way from Japan. <laughs> thank you, I do. I, I, I started reading the Wednesday when I saw it advertised on the philosophy list, the Philos L, about a year ago, or about a year and a half ago. And um, always enjoy the, the, the range of views um, and a sort of running theme or a few running themes throughout there thank in different much. media. Um, and uh, Raheem invited me uh, next time I'm in England, but every 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 next time I have been in England, I've always been quite busy. I still have still have small children, um, so um, this this inconvenience is actually quite in, quite convenient um, in a way. Um, so I, I gave a run through of my talk um, earlier today. It's about fifty three minutes or something, if I don't waffle. Um, it's in four sections. Uh, the first is a, is a biographical. Um, introduction, touching a little on the early poetry and here, Coleridge's cultural and philosophical influence. Section two um, is um, talking about the transcendence of reason as opposed to its imminence. Um, three is continuing that with his, his with Coleridge's take um, and, and his own peculiar or um, special uh, reason understanding division. And then we close on section four, which is on his modified Platonism. Um, now, uh, the introduction. Samuel Taylor Coleridge was a poet, a philosopher, and polymath. While best known for his early poems, he continued experimenting with poetic forms till the end of his life. Born the youngest of ten in Ottery St. Mary, Devon, he was schooled first by his father, the parish priest and master of the grammar school, and then, following his father's death when he was eight, at Christ's Hospital, London, a charity school for the boys of deceased clergy. He read profusely, describing himself as a library cormorant. Fellow bluecoat Charles Lamb remembers him unfolding the mysteries of Iamblichus and Plotinus in the cloisters. He next went to Jesus College, Cambridge, although he left to join the cavalry as a private under the pseudonym Silas Tomkin Cumberbatch. And when rescued by his brothers from this escapade and restored to Cambridge, he visited his friend and fellow poet Robert Southey in a summer vacation. And they dreamed up with poet Robert Lovell the utopian communistic scheme of Pantasocracy, resulting in Coleridge and Southey marrying Sarah and Edith Fricker, um, a pair of sisters who were the, the sisters of Lovell's own wife. And then they gathered more couples with whom they aimed to establish their radical democracy in America on the banks of the Susquehanna. The utopian plan never materialized. At 27, he collaborated with William Wordsworth on what is widely acknowledged to be the founding work of British Romanticism, the Lyrical Ballads in 1798, whose first and longest poem, and the one most praised on its publication, um, and Coleridge's name was known at the time, Wordsworth's wasn't, um, is, is Coleridge's sublime and supernatural rhyme of the ancient mariner. That ballad is often grouped with Kubla Khan and Christabel, the three being known as his mystery poems or poems of pure imagination. Defying easy comprehension, rarefied and by turns luminous and ominous, they nonetheless hold a widespread fascination and seem to convey encounters with the numinous. In and around this Annus Mirabilis of 1798, he also composed some of the greatest of what are known as his conversation poems, listed in the footnote there, which he later presented together as meditative poems in blank verse. These meditative or conversation poems generally begin in a relatively narrow area, such as a room at home or beneath a tree, with the poet considering domestic thoughts. 
the poems then usually open up to, or always open up to wider concerns, sometimes past and future, then into a more universal consideration of the one life within us and abroad. The form then returns to the smaller area where the poem began, but now with a greatly widened perspective of life and human concerns and of nature in the terms of a religious outlook related to eternity. Here, meditation or careful thinking through opens up into contemplation, a mental state that is still or focused, intuitive, and no longer comparative or discursive. His philosophical writings came later, but even in these early poems, one finds potent instances of meditation and contemplation <clears throat> that would become crucial to his theoretical work. In the Aeolian harp, contemplation descends upon a sensuous moment. How exquisite the sense, snatched from yon beanfield and the world so hushed. The stilly murmur of the distant sea tells us of silence. Characteristic here is the way the sensory gains an elevated quality as it trails off <clears throat> into a seemingly timeless moment. This profound impression is intensified at the end of Frost at Midnight, when he Im imagines the snow water thawing on his cottage roof and wonders whether the eavesdrops fall heard only in the trances of the blast, or if the secret ministry of frost shall hang them up in silent icicles, quietly shining to the quiet moon. The image of quietly expansive enlightenment reflecting back to its source is suggestive of his later <clears throat> philosophical view that each individual must bear witness of reason to his own mind, even as he describes light and life. And with the silence of light, it describes itself. In, in a way, he's talking about the self-evidence of reason there. This same non-discursive yet intellectual as well as sensuous impression of a deep connection between outer and inner recognition, uniting the contemplator and the contemplated, occurs again at the end of his poem to William Wordsworth, first titled To a Gentleman, composed on the night that Coleridge heard his friend finish reading, after many nights, his poem to Coleridge, posthumously published as The Prelude. Coleridge writes at the very end, Scarce conscious, and yet conscious of its close, I sate, my being blended in one thought. Thought was it, or aspiration, or resolve? Absorbed, yet hanging still upon the sound. And when I rose, I found myself in prayer. <coughs> His attention to meditation then, as a deep or careful thinking, passing into contemplation, as an intuitiveness beyond discursive thought, predates his explicitly philosophical prose writings and is the overall tendency of his medita meditative poems that go back to 1795. While Lyrical Ballads was at the press in September 1798, oh, by the way, um, as you know, zero is next to nine on the keyboard. And when I was typing this up at about 1 a.m. yesterday, I typed September 1708 without knowing I'd done that. Um, <laughs> there's a corrected version of this paper with other typos corrected. If you can see the chat screen, it says at the top here, from me to everyone. And then there's a link at the bottom of that. If you click on the file, you can get the corrected and slightly shortened version of this paper. Okay, without further ado. So Coleridge with William and Dorothy Wordsworth, while the lyrical ballads was at the press, set out for Germany at the suggestion of their physician friend, Thomas Beddoes, who commended the intellectual developments uh, in Germany and who five years earlier gave perhaps the first English language account of Kant's critique of pure reason. While the Wordsworth si siblings retreated to the Hartz Mountains, Coleridge enrolled at Göttingen University to improve his German and to take in lectures on subjects including metaphysics and physiology. The influence of German metaphysics on him was profound and continued over the next three decades. 
uh, he was very in a very intense study he was making up um, for, for some of his shortcomings at the end of his years at Cambridge. <clears throat> um, and this was further, this study was furthered at home, no doubt, by Coleridge's returning to England in June 1799 with a box of 30 pounds, he writes, worth of books, chiefly metaphysics, and with a view to the one work to which I hope to dedicate in silence the prime of my life. Over the next years, Coleridge's marriage proved unfortunate, although it produced children and was happy at the start. In 1808, he separated from Sarah to live in London for the rest of his life, um, save for about a year and a half in Malta, um, in a bid to curb his opium addiction and where he became acting public secretary to the, public, um, to the governor there. <clears throat> Many years later, Sarah moved to London and she and Coleridge were on good terms although they lived apart. Addicted to opium since an early prescription, for his last 18 years, he lived in the household of Dr. and Mrs. James Gilman, who helped him lower his dose. In these years, he wrote books on literary criticism and philosophical and theological questions, including The Statesman's Manual, 1816, Biographia Literaria the next year, The Friend the next year, um, a, a revised and much expanded edition of a newspaper he had started 10 years previous, um, Aids to Reflection in 1825, highly influential in its time um, in, the, in America too, On the Constitution of the Church and State, something that influenced um, Mill, um, J.S. Mill, and at the Gilman residence, he held his Thursday seminars in his attic book and bedroom and became known as a sage of Highgate, meeting promising young men, including John Sterling and of the Sterling Club and John Stuart Mill. <clears throat> Mill saw in Coleridge's hermeneutic and historical approaches and his critical approach an intelligent and cultivated corrective to the reductionist doctrines of Benthamite utilitarianism, which he obviously found so depressing, and the predominating mechanical and empiricist philosophies of his day. Mill thus attempted, specifically Coleridgean synthesis, wishing to fuse the best of both sides. From this, Mill derived, for example, his theory of the higher and lower pleasures, the lower being those which give merely frivolous pleasure with little or no deeper meaning, the higher bringing culture, contemplation, knowledge, and value. Doing this was a direct rebuke against Jeremy Bentham and perhaps his father uh, and Bentham's dictum that prejudice apart, the game of pushpin is of equal value with the arts and sciences of music and poetry. Coleridge's influence also extended in his own lifetime to America. James Marsh established the curricula of the University of Vermont on explicitly Coleridgean principles and his 1829, Coleridge died in 1834 by the way, and in Marsh's 1829, Marsh, the president of the University of Vermont, um, in his edition of Coleridge's Aids to Reflection from four years earlier, and his own, Marsh's own preliminary essay, this was the founding document of American transcendentalism, and one that shifted the perspective of many Americans, including the young John Dewey, from Lockean empiricism to transcendental and spiritual imagination-related concerns. Dewey remembered this book years later as our spiritual emancipation in Vermont, and he called it my first Bible. In 1833, Coleridge met Ralph Waldo Emerson in London and returned, who returned uh, full of the Coleridgean philosophy that initiated Concord or Boston Transcendentalism with Emerson's essay, Nature. After the sage of Highgate had already inspired Marsh's Vermont Transcendentalism too. In Anglican church history, Coleridge was a leading inspiration of the broad church movement, influencing Christian socialist F.D. Morris, liberal William Gladstone, the Anglo-Catholic Oxford movement, um, and reforming conservative Catholic Cardinal John Henry Newman. So in a, I mean, in a sense, he was, his own influence was itself a broad church. Um, um, a Renaissance, um, his influence on modern literary criticism was just as pervasive. Um, and his ideas in this field coursed through the 20th century and still have sway as a look, of, as a look at any, for example, dictionary of literary terms um, will show. A re uh, or, 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 or even essays on Shakespeare. A Renaissance man of the Romantic <coughs> Coleridge advanced modern literary criticism, was a political theorist, a journalist, a thinker of the modern life and chemical sciences, a public lecturer, 
on religion, politics, literature, and the history of philosophy, and a profound and influential philosopher himself. Section two, the transcendency of the nous in the sense, in the, in the Neoplatonic sense of intellect um, and reason, expounding what he called his ideal realism, that is the reality of ideas, the objective reality of ideas, I add. Coleridge argued for the reality of ideas as powers independent of the human mind. In 1806, he defined ideas as archetypal thoughts for him in the divine mind, anterior to creation and incomparably more real than all things besides. In this same text, he opposes his Christian Platonist sense against the unphilosophical jargon of Mr. Hume and his followers and their theories on what it is fashionable to misname impressions and ideas. For him, reason is the universal logos and ideas in their platonic sense are supersensual realities that transcend material forces, abstract concepts and empirical phenomena. While the material transcendent divide characterizes Coleridge's view of human experience, he also saw it as bridgeable, however imperfectly, by imagination stretching from sensations and concepts on one side toward the transcending ideas of reason on the other. So there's a divide, but imagination, in a sense, humanly, um, defeasibly, poorly, um, attempts to bridge it. Explaining this possibility, Coleridge equates the late antique and scholastic distinction between lux, L-U-X, lux, the substantial light of reason, and lumen, the illumination from that light, in a sense, the sun and its glow or something like that, while the substantial lux of reason remains transcendent and apart, its downshining lumen clarifies worldly objects and situations by revealing through them ultimate aims and symbolic intimations of eternal truths and values. <clears throat> Drawing down the higher light of ideas, he thought imagination is therefore a torchbearer of reason bringing down that light to human life and experience. And that's a boon, a benefit of contemplation itself, whether it's direct or indirect. From the early 1800s to 1816, his thinking was bound up in what I call an imagination period with his own views on the symbolic imagination and extricating his own views and, and, and clarifying them from, from Wordsworth's, whose preface and other things he had disagreed with. And once he was more or less satisfied with what he had put together, especially in the first um, volume of Biographia Literaria in 1816, not, not uh, 1815, but not published until 1817 with the second volume, his philosophy of ideas proliferated as he developed his view of universal reason as transcendent logos, ultimately based for him in the divine mind. In 1825, um, he gave his inaugural lecture to the Royal Society of Literature, arguing that there is a kind of myth with a religious meaning. He called it a philosopheme. In this, the substance is the stuff, he said, is philosophy. The form only is poetry. He cited Prometheus Bound, attributed to Aeschylus, as a prime example of such sublime mythos. The Prometheus expresses a proto-philosophical meaning that inheres in its ontological content. In this lecture, among other texts, Coleridge argues for the transcendence of reason, or nous, drawing in this instance on the Promethean derivation of the spark from above to mark the transcendency of the nous, the contradistinctive, he says, faculty of man as timeless and in this negative sense, eternal. Unlike the reason in evolutionary and process philosophers, um, such as C.S. Peirce or A.N. Whitehead, although both of those nonetheless were influenced by Coleridge, Coleridgean reason is transcendent, is utterly supernal. Um, as it, he says, the reason is not subject to any modifying reaction from that on which it immediately acts. It suffers no change and it receives no accession from the inferior 
that multiplies itself by conversion without being alloyed by or amalgamated with that which it potentiates, ennobles, transmutes. This sublime mythos concerning the genesis or birth of the nous or reason in man conveys a truth, he proposed, that in the Prometheus, that deeply impressed Heraclitus, as is known, and hence affected the subsequent history of metaphysics. Namely, the mere understanding, as he put it, differs from the animal, not through any inherent quality, but in virtue of its combining with far higher powers that are essentially different from it in kind. As is well known, Coleridge saw the fundamental difference in kind between the reason and the understanding as preeminently the greatest or step to philosophy, and as his mission in life to explain. What is less well known, however, is the form and extent of his commitment to this reason being transcendent, um, which I will um, uh, cover hopefully in section three, understanding divided from reason. While he adapted from empiricist theories, including associationism, he contended that they could not provide a complete account. His argument with empiricism was essentially that it made imminent too much that should remain transcendent. He therefore opposed Aquinas's Aristotelian dictum, which became central to Lockean empiricism, that nothing exists in the mind that was not first in the senses. Coleridge could only accept this dictum with Leibniz's in ingenious codicil, except the mind itself. The mere understanding is for Coleridge the an instrumental faculty, he says, of means to medial ends, that is to purposes or such ends as are themselves but means to some in ulterior end. His criticism of the excessive imminence in empiricism gained strength through his retention of elements of association theory, um, which he never disparaged, <clears throat> operating at the lower level of his own more holistic model of mind. Welcoming this, um, as he said, Catholic and unsectarian spirit of Coleridge's, J.S. Mill agrees that truths or half-truths from within utilitarianism and empiricism are retained in Coleridge's method, which is less extreme in its opposition because it denies less of what is true in the doctrine it wars against. <clears throat> he aimed to show his generally empiricist and increasingly utilitarian British contemporaries the dangers of understanding everything mechanistically, um, including mind and humanity. Despite uh, Coleridge seeming to many a romantic idealist crying in a utilitarian wilderness, Mill was partly converted amending his brand of utilitarianism along Coleridgean lines to gain a deeper and more humane cultural understanding, uh, which is, I think, how, how Mill is, is, is understood these days. At the heart of Coleridge's philosophy, then, lies the divide between the lower mechanical understanding, which is essentially self-interested, and transcendent reason. While human understanding is for him a more or less mechanical rule-bound information processing facility whose basic unit is the concept. Transcendent reason is, for him, the universal logos, independent of human thought, and which is the source of the idea. Idea hmm, is an established but troublesome translation. Oh, this, this bit isn't in your, your text unless you download the new one. It's, it's an established but troublesome translation of Plato's idea. Form for edos is little improvement, but both words already having familiar English meanings, but ones different from Plato's use of them. While Coleridge from around 1806 retains the platonic sense of the word idea, he is interested nonetheless in how this sense interrelates with the familiar general idea, as in having an idea. Um, but that is not the import um, of, of, of the way he uses the word. He uses it in the objective sense. Um, ideas in the Platonic sense that Coleridge developed are not purely human mental occurrences, as when someone has an idea, but positive powers existing beyond the human mind. For Coleridge, they are ultimately divine ideas, although one does not need to be a theist 
um, to uh, go along with that. Take, for example, Iris Murdoch's Platonism, which also holds the objectivity of ideas without her being a theist. Um, I won't digress there, but you don't have to be a theist in order to follow this, uh, in, in order even to subscribe to this kind of idea of the transcendence of ideas. Subsi so for him, they're, they're ultimately divine ideas subsisting in the mind of God and correlative with the laws of nature too. Um, in, a, in a sense, the two are almost interchangeable. What are the ideas being in a sense, a subjective aspect of, of law uh, and, and, and vice versa, the uh, laws being in a sense, the objective aspect of, of ideas in their objective sense. And he holds ideas and laws, as I said, to be necessary counterparts. So in the text below, um, I've copied perhaps just for fetish value, but I like it, the, um, the manuscript there, um, Coleridge's hand, um, drawing out um, what would then become printed um, in the Aids to Reflection book. And here he shows his understanding reason divide under the heading, the difference in kind of reason and the understanding. And if we please look, if you can, if you can scroll down to whatever page it was, is, it's around about page eight, I think, page 10 maybe, on your PDF. He has the two columns, understanding versus reason. The understanding, number one, is discursive, as opposed to reason, which is fixed. Two, the understanding in all its judgments refers to some other faculty as its ultimate authority. That is, the understanding refers to sense um, and look, looks, looks, in a sense, down to sense to, 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 to see um, what it is constructing, um, if what it is constructing um, abides with the, uh, the notices or impressions of sense. But it also looks up. It looks up to, for example, the, 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 the laws of logic, the law of contradiction and non-contradiction, etc. It looks up to reason, um, but it, it does not subsist in itself. It is not self-sufficient. On the other hand, reason in all its decisions appeals only to itself as the ground and substance of their truth. Self-evident, apodictic. Three, the understanding is the faculty of reflection. And this is key here. <clears throat> the understanding is the faculty of reflection, thinking again, bending back, folding back, looking. Um, um, uh, it's the self-consciousness of not just being aware, but being aware that one is aware and of performing operations like a kind of loop in a computer, performing operations on the notices of the sense and on one's own, for example, wants and needs. Um, it's the faculty of reflection. Reason, however, is, the, is of contemplation. He doesn't even say it's a faculty because he later says it's not a faculty. Reason is of contemplation. Reason indeed, he says, this is very interesting, reason indeed is far nearer to sense than to understanding. For reason is a direct aspect of truth, an inward beholding, having a similar relation to the intelligible or spiritual as sense has to the material or phenomenal. So sense and reason are alike in their different ways, but they are both intuitive, um, which is something, of, of course, understanding is not. Understanding is discursive. The result of, 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 of this thinking, is, he says, the result is that ne neither understanding nor reason falls under the definition of the other. They differ in kind. This is not a distinction. This is a division. Where for Coleridge, the understanding is discursive in moving between propositions and examples. It's discursive. Medial in referring itself uh, below itself, the evidence of the senses or above itself to the self-evidence of reason. And thirdly, reflective in operating on its own abstractions. The reason is fixed in being non-discursive, absolute, for him, eternal. It's also secondly, self-evident being its own ground. And thirdly, the reason is contemplative, being an intuitive, inward beholding of the intelligible, or uh, to use a word that some will balk at, I'm afraid, spiritual. But if you can listen to that in a 19th century sense, possibly too. This essential divide between understanding and reason makes Coleridge's a philosophy of transcendence. Yet rather than conceiving of this central divide as the utter separation of human being from transcendent reason, he posited <clears throat> the transcendence directedness of imagination and its symbols as imperfectly as humanly traversing the divide between concept and idea. It does this, he thought, by an intuitive anticipation, 
by induction as opposed to deduction in the understanding, and by symbolism, where the part stands for the larger whole of the overarching principle that makes the particular instances possible. Examples include Newton's falling apple and his anticipation of his theory of gravitation. And in an illustration Curlewidge borrowed from Robert Burns, the idea of impermanence symbolized by snow that falls upon a river, a moment white then gone forever. Explaining how the symbol exemplifies with remarkable intensity the universal in the particular, he describes the imaginative perception of the higher in the lower such that a symbol, he says, is characterized by a translucence of the special in the individual, or of the general in the special, or of the universal in the general. <clears throat> Above all, by the translucence of the eternal through and in the temporal. The symbol always partakes of the reality which it renders intelligible. This 1816 definition of the symbol develops from Schelling's 1802 characterization, where intellectual intuition is simply the capacity, Schelling defines, to see the universal in the particular, the finite, the infinite in the finite, the two combined into a living unity. What we have here is um, intellectual intuition as um, some kind of facility to perceive the more general in the more um, specific and indeed in the particular and so that the, the the broader meaning the broader reference as it were shines through or is translucent in uh, one's um, immediate and very particular and real um, actual uh, experience um, uh, it's a kind of luminosity to experience uh, in the next century gestalt psychologists such as wolfgang Köhler would describe cognitive intuition in similar terms of anticipation, the perception of gestalts and the aha moment. And in some important respects, their research continues that of post-Kantian transcendental thinkers, including Schelling and Coleridge, not only in their shared concepts, but also in their strong opposition to radical empiricism um, of the kind in which parsimonious and eliminativist accounts of mind and behavior occur for example, those of David Hume and in the 20th century, B. F. Skinner. And then nowadays in, in, in the works of, of, of Paul and Patricia Churchland, among others. Coleridge develops Kant's framing of the Verstand Vernunft or the understanding reason distinction. He favors, however, the original version, which was Plato's between Dianoia and Noesis. Contra its transcendental rather than transcendent status in Kant, reason for Coleridge and Plato can be intuited purely without images, with its ideas being real powers beyond the human mind. Convergently, in fact, Plato, Kant and Coleridge agree that it's the higher understanding, Plato's dianoia, and not the reason that creates abstractions and theory and theories with images, schemata, and hypotheses. Kant and Coleridge also agree with Plotinus, but not always with the letter of Plato, that the imagination creates symbols that represent the ideas of reason aesthetically. Still, Plato says this too in his poetic passages, such as the winged charioteer of the soul in the Phaedrus and in the symposium with Diotima's steps or ladder of love, by which one may ascend from the physical aesthetic sense of beauty through moral qualities to an at once intellectual and aesthetic vision of the ideal sea of beauty. So we have Kant, Coleridge and Plotinus and Plato agreeing somewhat um, on this possibility of imagination as a route to the ideas. Um, but for Kant, they are transcendental, not transcendent. By this imaginative aesthetic route, general experience becomes suffused with intimations of ideas, which are otherwise wholly transcendent to sense experience. This kind of intimation allows for the aesthetic apprehension or anticipation of ideas such as freedom, justice, the eternal, the infinite, without requiring them themselves to be imminent. For Kant, however, though the ideas are transcendental, 
being a priori prerequisites that regulate experience and knowledge. Those ideas are dependent on the human mind in which they subsist as necessary components and they are therefore in that sense imminent to the human mind. Coleridge took pains to point out the harm in treating, in thinking in a certain way, in treating distinctions between two or more things of the same kind as divisions or rifts between kinds. And he notes that we are prone to separate things artificially that are not truly divided. In order to distinguish them more clearly, uh, that's, a, that's a weakness, we, we you know, murder to dissect, as, as, as his friend said. He, he states that this principle, he states this principle in the aphoristic form, that it is a dull and obtuse mind that must divide in order to distinguish. But it is a still worse that distinguishes in order to divide. It is all the more notable then, um, given his cautions um, against division, it is all the more notable then when he does indeed affirm and analyze the real and separating differences between understanding and reason. The understanding exists, he held, in a basically Kantian view, in varying degrees in different people and in some animal species as the faculty judging according to sense and arranging via concepts, making, order of, uh, making orders um, and, uh, via concepts. There are, however, he maintained, no degrees of reason. Okay, there are degrees of understanding in between people, there are degrees of understanding uh, be between different kinds of animals, but you have reason or not. I mean, you're, you're compass mentis or not, in a way. Um, there, are there, there are no degrees of reason. Indeed, unlike the understanding, reason for him is no faculty at all. For reason, he says, reason with the silence of light describes itself and dwells in us only as far as we dwell in it. It cannot, in strict language, be called a faculty, much less a personal property of any human mind. This is why Coleridge says that we can speak, he says, of the human understanding in disjunction from that of beings higher and lower than man. But there is in this sense no human reason. There neither is nor can be but one reason, one and the same. From here we move on now to section four um, and the last section, Coleridge's polarised and modified Platonism. Coleridge maintained the reality of ideas in the Platonic sense, but what kind of Platonism can be ascribed to him? Whether or not Plato supports such a theory, and I don't think he does, uh, but that's not the point, Coleridge's is not a replicating correspondence form of Platonic idealism, where for every kind of thing, such as hyenas or teacups, there is a correspondent ideal form somehow floating around. For Coleridge, <clears throat> as indeed I think for Plato, it's not as if justice, freedom, or the law of gravitation exist as floating by to be intuited by some genius or some Socrates or some scientist. Yet such is, unfortunately, a fairly common pastiche of theories of noesis, or Platonism or intellectual intuition. To their adherents, however, the adherents of those theories, ideas and laws are to be intuited in the sense of being read from constellations of phenomena and arising within um, or erupting from those in which they are expressed. For Goethe, for instance, advances in knowledge come from perceiving through ur phenomena or the primal, especially representative phenomena that prominently exemplify their entire genera and its essential properties, and in that way can signify the class as archetypes, providing especially penetrating and generalizable insights. He found such examples in botany, um, you know, the certain kind of leaf which could actually stand for all in, in that in, in, in the genera, um, 
because its um, anatomy um, uh, was, on the outside was more, was more simply schematizable, that sort of thing, finding representative phenomena. That's one way in, in, <clears throat> in which the form, the idea, um, can be intimated through experience. Such reading from and perceiving in takes various forms, many of which were accepted and promulgated by Coleridge, such as the platonic induction from particulars to law-like ideas, or Baconian induction from experimental phenomena to laws of nature, and his own, the Coleridgean symbol, which is at once an analogy and a part of the wider whole which it represents and also imaginative anticipation of which Persian abduction became a later example. <clears throat> Coleridge developed a dynamic idealism where existence arises and evolves in the interplay of oppositional powers. All right, it's a dynamic idealism. He also called it an ideal realism. For him, ideas are universal archetypal forms that, actualizes them, that actualize themselves in the interplay of opposed forces. They, um, they create their actuality. Uh, that is to say that their reality is something which could exist even if there is no physical con um, cosmos. Their reality is something which is, exists is might, perhaps the wrong word. Their, their reality is something which might obtain, which will obtain even if there is no physical uh, cosmos. Um, in their interplay via oppositions, they express themselves in the actualized phys physical cosmos. For him, ideas are universal archetypal forms then. They are energies and not only potentialities. You can understand a, a certain reality. People talk about this in the philosophy of modality, what is possible and so on, um, where certain possibilities are real or potentialities are real, but there's nothing very actual or existential about them unless actual infinite worlds are hypothesized or that sort of thing. Well, he's not talking only about potentialities, or if he is, he's talking about potentialities with the emphasis on potent, on powers, on actual energies. That is, they are powers, and in this sense, his is a dynamic philosophy after dynamis or dunamis, the Greek power force. Not dynamic as simply moving, but in that, in that deeper sense um, of, of power and force. Like Plato's, Coleridge's idealism does not refute the existence of matter, not at all. And it's a terrible prestige, it's a very easy, cheap argument to say that certain idealists do that. He argues instead that ideas and powers precede material existence. Since the 20th century, physics has grown closer to dynamic, energic theories of the arising of matter and its vicissitudes, and has abandoned the mechanist or pascular theories, as is well known, that were dominant in the Enlightenment in Coleridge's day, too, and in much of the 19th century. Rather than dismiss dynamic idealist theories as apparently denying matter, it should be recognized that they were almost prepossessed with the problem of the origin and nature of matter. Perhaps dynamic, this is a small digression for a few lines, perhaps dynamic, um, but I think pertinent, theories of matter and the metaphysics of powers might help to make further inroads into what's called the hard problem in the philosophy of mind, namely the ontological question of how there can be consciousness at all. This problem lies behind a current revival in theories of panpsychism. I think over the last 10 or 12 years or so, arguing that some organisms can have self-consciousness because all matter is in some elementary sense already conscious. Okay, the, 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 the hard problem has proven so intractable um, that there's a, a, a very real uh, revival in many th in, in theories of panpsychism to say that mind is already an inherent um, quality of stuff, of, of material stuff. Dynamic idealism, however, could rival or expand this approach, this panpsychic approach, by commencing not from matter plus or you know, super added with, added with some quality, primal consciousness inherent in matter, um, but with matter as itself arising from more fundamental powers. Um, it's 
the quantitative extension of matter evolving from the qualitative intention of powers or, or more primal energies. The eventual realization of consciousness in living organisms might then be theorized as the actualization of fundamental powers as ideas. So through the, you know, the long evolution of the universe through, you know, um, towards the very end when life arises, and then there's some kind of consciousness that we know about that, you know, because we are here to know about it and it's a self-consciousness for us. Um, this eventual realization or actualization of consciousness in living organisms could then be theorized as the actualization of fund those fundamental powers um, as ideas and laws from which perhaps, according to uh, the dynamic um, um, philosophies of people like Coleridge and Schelling, um, and those ideas will be understood in the, in, as intellectual potencies um, or, or, or cosmic potencies, as has been suggested by thinkers from Plato, Plotinus uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, John Scotus, Eriogena, to um, the Romantic era, Schelling, Hegel and Coleridge. But if dynamic idealism has anything to it, any truth to it, how could we even know it if the ideas are supposed to be fundamental powers that are transcendent? How, could we, how would we even know about that? The imagination is an important mediating concept here, as, as I've been suggested earlier. If an idea is to mean something to us, if an idea is to mean anything to us, it must first engage us. And that occurs through aesthetic expression. It must first be felt. Indeed, the term aesthetic expression becomes pleonastic in this context, for any expression requires sensuous material or reference. The relation is bidirectional, but hierarchical. As Coleridge puts it, by the symbol, the idea is rendered cogitable, but by the idea, the symbol is rendered intelligible. Coleridge defines philosophy as the affectionate seeking after truth, with truth as the, as the correlative of being. And he later identifies this pursuit as, the, as philosophy, as the doctrine and discipline of ideas. But it is not only philosophers, he claims, who are stirred by ideas. He says, at the enunciation of principles, of ideas, the soul of man awakes and starts up as an exile in a far distant land at the unexpected sounds of his native language, when after long years of absence and almost oblivion, he is suddenly addressed in his own mother tongue. He theorizes ideas then as transcendent, yet somehow more interior than anything else. Ideas are recognized in his view as confrères, as it were, of the soul, or something like that. No object or phenomenon in sense experience itself amounts to an idea, but ideas arise nonetheless in the living of a life, in the recognition of purposes and in the apprehension of value, personhood, freedom and beauty, the, la the last being examples of ideas which he names. These ideas, he argues, constitute humanity. For try to conceive a man without the ideas of God, eternity, freedom, will, absolute truth of the good, the true, the beautiful, the infinite. An animal endowed with a memory of appearances and of facts might remain, but the man will have vanished, and you have instead a creature, more subtle than any beast of the field, but likewise cursed above every beast of the field. Humanity for Coleridge transcends very romantically, the mechanical, animal and phenomenal because it is constituted by the ideas in such a way that humanity may, that humans may contemplate them. The Coleridgean idea is that which cannot be generalized, on which the mind can exercise no modifying functions, that which can only be contemplated, he says that which is deeper than all intelligence, inasmuch as it represents the element of the will and its essential inderivability. 
you can infer there, therefore, from that statement that um, because he theorizes ideas as transcendent and as objective, that there is in that, that that will, that a wish, that that some kind of um, volition um, is a, a quality of the universe. Um, and therein you find his uh, theism. Although I, I said earlier that you don't have to be a theist in order to, to follow and even subscribe like, like Iris Murdoch to his theory of ideas. While Coleridge was a proponent of clarity and definition concerning concepts and relations of terms in discourse, he held with the Plato of the seventh letter that all attempts to express ideas in clear and definite terms must end in aporia, not unlike the Kantian antinomies. Intuited, but not deduced, ideas are beyond the purview of the conceptual, beyond the bounds of sense, etc. Yet he notes, disciples of Locke, Hume and Condillac would laugh at the man who should ask them for the image of a flavour or the odour of a strain of music. And to ask for the conception of an idea is, if possible, yet more irrational. A much later notebook entry returns to the same thought here. And he adds that of an idea, we can no more understand it than we can taste or smell a conception of the understanding. We can contemplate it, we can't comprehend it. We can apprehend it, we can't comprehend, comprehend it. But there are moments, I think undeniably, when one finds oneself in such contemplation. Annotating um, the German Kantian historian of philosopher Tenemann's Geschichte or History of Philosophy, uh, while compiling his own lectures on the history of philosophy, um, which he gave around London, Coleridge schematically outlined his two-level polar theory in his Order of the Mental Powers diagram, which schematizes his system of mind as follows. Oh, well, there's another manuscript from Coleridge. He gives the simplest yet practically sufficient order of the mental powers. He says it is beginning from the lowest, and he gives it in two columns there, beginning from sense from the lowest and then through to fancy or fantasy and then to the lower or mechanical instinctive understanding. And then he draws a bar. And then there's the higher understanding, the understanding that has been enlightened by the downshine of reason, mediated by the imagination above it and then to reason. And he writes that down again in reverse order. He writes a note on the side of that as well, saying that fancy or fantasy and imagination are oscillations. This connecting reason and understanding, that is to say, um, imagination connecting reason and understanding, and fancy connecting sense and understanding. What we have here basically are the three Kantian fundamental, um, Kant called them faculties, but Coleridge didn't call reason a faculty, but we have the, the three fundamentals of human mind. Sense, in a sense, if you'll allow the metaphor, sense in a sense at the bottom, understanding, mediating, and so at the middle, and reason, um, which is higher. And those are the three fundamentals of mind. To have any kind of mind um, which is humane, you also need to have reason or rationality. And then somehow, in, in an almost chemical electrical image here, fancy and imagination arise as emergent uh, qualities or, or facilities. They arise as oscillations or wavelengths between. So fancy or fantasy arises when you bring, as it were, the magnets of sense and understanding of sensuality and on conceivability together. Something like fantasy arises in a living creature which has needs. Um, and again, when you bring understanding near to what he calls reason, ideas, principles, there arises reason, which goes between the two. Fantasy, our fantasy, goes between sense and understanding. 
our imagination goes between our understanding and reason. Here we see Coleridge's scheme of the mental powers or epistemological modes, which arguably modifies Plato's famous simile of the divided line. The bar <coughs> between the higher understanding and the lower understanding that he draws within the wider context of the mental powers, uh, the, the difference of, in kind of reason and understanding that Coleridge outlined around the same time in Aids the Reflection. This divide is equivalent to Plato's division between theoretic abstract understanding, his dianoia on one hand, and intuitive or dialectic contemplation, noesis. Plato places this dianoia, his higher understanding, above everyday understanding and pragmatic belief, which is pistis, and below the noesis or higher reason that he claims perceives and contemplates higher truths and ideas, whether directly in intuition or after the logical approach of dialectic. Well, I said he claims, but really Plato has Socrates explain the theory of ideas to Glaucon, who is Plato's brother, his actual brother, in a way that allows a schematic initial understanding of the proposed ontology and epistemology of that theory. It's very interesting and I think, in a sense, knowing might be the word, um, that Plato uses an abstract schema in order to show that abstract schema are in, um, eventually superseded by something beyond it, which he calls noesis. A line, then, in the divided line, I think you all know it, a line is first divided in an uneven ratio. The lower section of the line is shorter than the higher, with relative length. Uh, the relative length, so you have a shorter subsection at the bottom and a, and a longer section at the top. And the, the relative uh, length, Plato actually says, represents what he, what he says is saphenia, that means clarity or clarity of knowledge. So the longer upper section, episteme, knowledge, has greater clarity, being more properly knowledge than the lower doxa, opinions. Each section is then further subdivided according to that initial ratio. This has the mathematically necessary result that the upper section of the lower division is of the same length and thus represents the same intermediate degree of clarity as the lower section of the higher division. That is to say, you have a very, very small, lower, murky, muddy, imagistic kind of section at the bottom, right? Um, and at the very top, you have the long section of noesis or, or contemplation. Um, and then the two sections in the middle are, are, are the same degree of clarity. The sections are, as, as, I, as I've written out here, Echasia, Pistis, Dianoia, Noesis. Echasia is to Pistis as Dianoia is to Noesis, is the way it works. What does that mean? It means seeing and fancying images, that's Echasia, seeing and fancying or fantasizing images um, is a case here. That is the same root as the word ekon or icon, which means likeness. And in modern Greek, actually, it means guesswork, um, which, which works very well. That faculty or facility is, is the common sense belief or pistis and everyday understanding as abstract, conceptual, we might say academic understanding, dianoia and, and scientific is to the higher reason and the contemplative intuition of ideas, noesis. To rephrase, naive, illusory, imagistic thought, think of the prisoners in the cave, is to pragmatic, getting by in everyday trust, think of farmers who know exactly when to plant and when to reap, but they can't tell you the science necessarily and they'll, they'll dismiss some theories, uh, but they know very well in their pragmatic way, pragmatic, their thingly way, um, is that, that, that ratio of, 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 as it were, the prisoners in the cave versus the uh, farmers who just know exactly what they're doing in their own sphere of physical activity, dealing with things, not just images now, not like the prisoners or the children in the cave or, that ratio is the same as, but in a lower level, as theoretical understanding, as scientific, academic, 
um, schematic, conceptual, abstract understanding and hypo hypothesizing is to contemplative intuition. For example, in, in our you know, academic work, we often come up with theories and hypotheses, which could actually be signifying airy nothing, <laughs> just like the prisoners in the cave. Um, and, 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 and the lights and the patterns that they see and their hypotheses could actually, do actually signify airy nothing. Um, in Coleridgean terms, this schema is as follows. I'm saying that um, Coleridge is modifying Plato's divided line. And I've drawn this down below. Coleridge, in Coleridgean terms, this same divided line is sense plus fancy is imagistic thought. That is to lower understanding, which is mechanical and instinctive and self-interested thought, right? Sense and fancy is to that self-interested and instinctive understanding as the higher understanding is to contemplative reason, as discursive, theoretic, symbolic, and even imaginative thought is to contemplation. So intuitive sense and imagistic fancy or fantasy relate to the lower understanding as the higher understanding plus symbolic imagination relates to intuitive reason. But Coleridge made a modification to Plato here. That is at once neoplatonic and romantic. Namely, his schema begins in naive intuition, like, like Plato's do, progresses through, again like Plato, advancing stages of culture, education, and science, but differently from Plato, it ends up where it began, with intuition again, but spiraled higher in a pattern familiar in Plotinus, in his ideas of the procession from and reversion to the intellect or nous. Familiar also in Hegel's evolution of spirit in, in, in the phenomenology of spirit. Familiar also in Yeats's A Vision and his spirals, remember? And Eliot's Four Quartets, what is it, In My End is My Beginning, and so on. As well as in Coleridge's own conversation poems, as I, you know, briefly summarized in, in section one. The, the, he, he likes to write those poems uh, as a kind of an robber, a, Ouroboros, uh, with, with the snake with the tail in its mouth. You, you, you end where you begin, but in a sense, um, on a higher plane, um, or you know, with, a high, with a greater vantage. Um, after all, you've, 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 you've gone through to get there, and you're back at home. While Plato's divided line is linear and progressive, Coleridge's diagram, though also progressive, it's not straightforwardly linear. Yes, it's a line, but it has a pronounced bipolarity and has a harmonic balance, as, as, as somebody uh, brought out. Um, um, Barbara, you picked up earlier what Coleridge thought by uh, Owen Barfield. I did, yes. Like, I was just reminding myself of something, yes. Yes, this, this idea of, of, of that in Coleridge, that, that here he's showing a harmonic balance in the powers um, is, is something which he had a very good insight there, and, and I owe that to him. He achieves this, Coleridge achieves this harmony, this, this difference from Plato, uh, but because you see, as, as is famous, you know, Plato in, in many interpretations disparages the imagistic. I don't think that's entirely true, and, dis, and, he, and, and he certainly doesn't disparage the poetic, he just thinks it can be, behave itself better sometimes. Um, and they shouldn't be scientists, and they, they shouldn't be professors of science and history. I think we can agree there. Um, <clears throat> Coleridge, is, Coleridge makes this advance by proposing a chiasmic intersection, an X, a cross, a crux, a crucible, a, a chiasmic intersection at the center of the order of the mental powers where higher and lower understanding, that is where mechanism and freedom, where nature and spirit an unfashionable word, I'm afraid. Meat. He gets there, as, as I show in my recent book, I'm sorry for the plug, but I cannot detail here, by fusing the cosmogonic, radically non-hierarchical, transmutational, both directions at once system 
of a thinker who is very obscure, the German mystic Jakob Berner, the Protestant um, mystic. Um, he was a, a shoemaker, as you probably know, with the hierarchical. Coleridge fuses this crazy, messy, murky, elaborate, uh, intensely thoughtful uh, system of Jakob Berman, who was much more influential than he's given credit for. He fuses that transmutational system and, and trichotomous logic, which, which some people think um, is what occurs in Kant, and then everyone, or a lot of people know, we find this in Schelling and in Hegel, who themselves said, yes, I got this from Burma. Um, Coleridge fuses that system with the more hierarchical system of Plato and later Christian Platonists, especially, <coughs> enough, um, Hugh and Richard of St. Victor, um, the, 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 the medieval thinkers, whom he, but they were Neoplatonists, whom he encountered in Tenement's History of Philosophy. And reading them, and then thinking back to Jakob Berner and trying to fuse the two, correcting both, is what leads him to draw out his order of the mental powers, which, we, which we've been looking at. Jakob Berner, strange, interesting man, formulated a profound cosmogony of intense non-spatial spirits or properties which interfuse to create the universe. Coleridge is was quite well known for his marginalia. He annotated um, many books, but no, not many people got cross with, with him when he gave their books back and they were scribbled all over. Um, and, and some people commented that their value was increased that way. Um, you know, he doesn't just add exclamation marks and underlinings or no, 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 etc. cetera. Um, he, he, he writes essays on through the margins and on the fly papers, et cetera. Um, Coleridge wrote more marginalia on Jakob Burma's collected works than any other collection of books, including the Bible, including Kant, including anything, including Shakespeare, including Baxter, including anybody he was, he was reading. His, he has a, a very long conversation with him. He's, but Burma is pretty much ignored, apart from a few people. Fulford wrote one essay on him or touched on him. Beer wrote quite a bit, John Beer. Um, <laughs> Um, but there's been very little because it's so difficult. Um, very little work on, on, on Berner and Coleridge. And yet he was um, profoundly influential on Coleridge, as he himself said. Um, so Berner had this system um, in which the interesting thing here is, it's very interesting in, in, in the history of thought. Berner has a primal logic of qualities, logic of qualities of qualia, that evolves into a subsequent cosmos of quantities, as in the Newtonian universe, the Galilean universe, right? Working as he did around the same time, although not knowing them in, any, in, 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 in reading or any other way, working around the same time as Bacon and Galileo, he is in some sense their mirror opposite. Where those natural philosophers instituted an empiricism of outwardness, extendedness, and quantities, and subsequent logics, etc., and methodologies, Burma forged an experiential and transmutational system of inwardness, intention, and qualities, a logic of qualities, which is what Coleridge loved in him. Burma greatly influenced Schelling, as is very well known. Influenced Coleridge, as is well known, but not, dis not well discussed and hugely influenced Hegel, who says as much himself. Hegel called Burma, he said, this deep yet uneducated man, he said, is the first German philosopher. Coleridge, however, struggled more than his German counterparts against Jakob Burma, whom he loved so much, and whom he nonetheless greatly admired and continued reading from his school days in Christ's hospital till the end of his life in 1834, but most intensely did so in the years around 1818, in the summer of which he recognized with a bit of a start the tendency to pantheism and the immanentization of divinity and reason that Burma could lead to, and hence, um, did lead to pantheism, especially in the early and possibly mid Schelling, who had largely adopted Bahmanistic or Burma's uh, cosmogony. Thus, from 1818, 
Coleridge takes off more strongly into his own, becomes less influenced by Schelling and related thinkers, and commences his own thrilling trajectory of thought into ideas and their imperfect human contemplation. Unlike with Burma and his close followers, for Coleridge, the order is always hierarchical, with reason highest, transcendent and tantamount for him to divinity. Reason on the human side, he said, not considering it now um, as, as objective logos, but reason on the human side is contemplative. It's an openness to reason proper. Considered from the outside, from the outside the human mind, his reason is the logos. Logos in a Heraclitean, as well as a Christian, Johannine sense, you know, in the beginning was the word, or the Heraclitean logos. It's the ratio of the cosmos, the hierarchical balance of forces and powers, the, and of ultimate ends, the source of value and of the ideas. Plato's scheme to return is straightforwardly linear or unipolar, and Plato just needs one ascending ratio of two ratios, okay? Uh, imagistic thought is the common sense uh, understanding as uh, academic understanding is to contemplation and neurosis. He, he just needs that. But because Coleridge's scheme or schema is bipolar and chiasmic, uh, it has that crossways section in the middle, his extremes of sense, and reason mediated by the enlightened understanding. His extremes have a harmonic and chiasmic similarity, not explicitly shared by Plato's imagistic thought and noesis or contemplation. Coleridge's counterpart poles of sense and reason draw human experience outwards in both directions. They draw human life uh, and world towards both ends of the aesthetic intellectual spectrum into a reality that transcends the understanding without disparaging it. While it cannot be comprehended, this reality can nonetheless be apprehended. And with such apprehensions, the greatest meaning and value is found even in the most ordinary contexts. Uh, as when friendship, for example, or interpersonal equality or peace, love, reasons for admiration, hope, and even fear in society. Nature and existence itself are intuited in the course of daily life when we go about the course of things and those things mean something. While sense <laughs> pulls towards intrinsic nature, that sounds a bit arcane, while sense pulls towards nature as naturing, the, the, not just as phenomena, but the inner workings of nature. While sense pulls us towards that, sense pulls us even beyond nature. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm afraid I made a mistake there. Sense pulls us even beyond phenomena, uh, deeper into um, some kind of natural connection. And in the opposite direction, reason and imagination pulls us towards the reality of the ideas the reality of the rightness of things, the, 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 the possibilities of beauty, um, the senses of our not measuring up um, to those objective realities, Pull, stretches us in the opposite direction. And thus the, 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 the human mind is stretched in both directions, sometimes at once. Between these extremes, everything we can comprehend or conceive passes through the cognitive chiasmus of the higher and lower understanding, the higher being discursive and enlightened, the lower being impulsive and instinctual, but we need them all. He's not disparaging that middle. He's not saying it's utterly forlorn or forgotten. Um, everything that we are to experience must pass through exactly that chiasmus of the understanding. Flanking his concept and, and, and the art of poetry is drawing with, with one arm stretched as far down as you can to sense and the aesthesis or the aesthetic, and the other arm stretching as far up as you can into the ideas, that's only, that's, that's, you're only halfway there to poetry or history or philosophy, he thinks. The job then is to bring that down 
and to render that in what he calls the discourse of reason, to, to articulate that into a form that can be communicated to others. Flanking this, um, using concepts illuminated by reason, flanking this conceptual crux are fancy below and imagination above. Uh, I think I can skip this a little bit. Coleridge is an almost poematic schema. It's like verse in an A, the order of the mental powers. It's like verse in an ABC CBA rhyme scheme. The fact that he sketched the columns of the mental powers out of place in reversed orders indicates complementarities, brings out the further cross currents, counterpoint, and harmonies, as well as his notion that the powers cooperate chiastically. While it progresses from the lowest level sense to the highest reason, as does Plato's divided line, Coleridge's extremes are pronouncedly counterparts. His extremes of sense and reason are pronouncedly counterparts. But so too are the intermediaries of fancy and imagination. As too are the actual, um, is the actual crux, that yet the, the polarized higher and lower modes of understanding. The, the higher being enlightened, the lower being self-interested. Fancy bridges intuitive sense and the lower understanding. And this lower level oscillation mirrors what's happening in imagination as that also moves between uh, two um, poles, between higher understanding and intuitive reason. The lower and higher levels of understanding, which are equivalent to Plato's pistis or pragmatic getting on with things and dianoia, uh, conceptual abstract theorizing are also counterparts and their opposition affects the crucial chiasmus of mind through which ideas and images cross over and transform where intermediary concepts are given shape before being sent out on their various missions to the edges of experience. Owen Barfield memorably notes that Coleridge's complementarities in this schema are like octaves and as Wordsworth wrote in his poem to Coleridge, the prelude, the mind of man is framed even like the breath and harmony of music. There is a dark, invisible workmanship that reconciles discordant elements and makes them move in one society. Indeed, there is more in common or in tune between reason and sense in Coleridge's theory than between reason and understanding. Even though understanding is closer to reason along the pole. In an apt similitude, we might say, Antarctica is far more like the Arctic, its polar counterpart and opposite, than New Zealand is, its linearly nearer neighbour. Referring to this reason sense analogy and their shared intuitiveness, Coleridge describes reason as an organ bearing the same relation to spiritual objects the universal, the eternal, and the necessary, as the eye bears to material and contingent phenomena. For Coleridge, contemplative reason, I'm on the last paragraph now, contemplative yeah. reason is to an even greater degree than its adjutant imagination, a being of the same kind as its objects. It is apt, I think, that it was a poet who observed and articulated these intellectual or spiritual and sensual connections and devised an elegant schema describing their interrelation, alert as he was to conceptual rhymes in the balance of opposed yet complementary powers. This harmonic scale within the hierarchical relation between sense and reason is born of a rationalist intuitionism, acknowledging that the aesthetic and the noetic operate at opposite epistemological poles, but in such a way that as in Burma's cosmology, extremes meet. It also accords with, yet goes beyond, Coleridge, uh, Plato's divided line, so that by bringing out the harmony between sense and reason, Coleridge also demonstrates their essential similarity. And, like Kant's system, it synthesizes empiricism and rationalism, but it does so in a way that retains the transcendence of reason and the ideas. Okay, I've uh, finished there. There's a little end note which you have um, in which I give the link to uh, the Oxford Scholarship online uh, 
uh, location where the book that I've recently written um, can be found and read through entirely. Um, if you have an institutional login, you can read that freely. Um, and I also have added, if you want to download the, the corrected version of this paper, I've added a very brief bibliography. Um, the idealist philosopher in 1930, J.H. Muirhead, um, wrote it, uh, Coleridge as Philosopher, then Owen Barfield, uh, his Co What Coleridge Thought in 1972, um, the intellectual historian Mary Ann Perkins, her Coleridge as Philosophy, the Logos as Unifying Principle in 1994, Douglas Headley's mentioned uh, Coleridge, Philosophy and Religion, 2000, um, the literary professor Paul Hamilton in London, um, Coleridge and German Philosophy in 2007, and in the same department as him, James Vigus's Platonic Coleridge in 2009. And that's a select um, bibliography of works that touch on uh, this, this theme. Okay, can, thanks. Can I think I, I ask you about, I think went about 10 Hardy. minutes over there, but we did start a bit late too. Yeah. Can Who's I ask talking? you about Daniel Hardy? What does it, Daniel it, it, Hardy it, it, say about Coleridge? I don't know Daniel Hardy. Oh, David Clough, are you talking? Uh, yeah, it is me, but I, I, it's a David Ford link, but it doesn't matter if you don't know him, it's fine. Hang on a minute. Dick, Daniel Hardy. I'll just, I'm just taking some notes. Uh, wh why did you mention that connection? Well, only because in American theology, you know, he seems a bit influential, but I, he never figures in the Coleridge books list that you've read out there. You know, so, I, so I'm right. just puzzled where he fits. Right. <laughs> I don't know much of his work either. You know, this is the difficulty, mm -hmm. but... Yeah. Okay, I'll look him up. Thank you. Yeah, I think David Ford married his daughter. And there's a link mm -hmm. there. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, carry on to the end of talk. Yeah. Well, that's so, it. That's I it. I just want yes. to get that question in in case there was a sudden <laughs> eureka moment, but there isn't, so it's fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> David, David, if you don't mind, I think mm. either uh, Barbara or Edward got comments. To yes, I know. I know they will have. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Barbara, would you like to say something? Oh, thank you. Yes, yes, I would. Thanks very much, Bruce. Thank you. And um, I, I always enjoy hearing Coleridge talked about in a sympathetic way. So thank you very much. Mm. And my, my comment comes from somebody who's approached Coleridge from his poetry. And that's taken me a little way into his philosophy, which mm. is hard work. I've found hard work, but very rewarding when I read Owen Barfield's. Um, I agree. And um, because Owen Barfield himself starts from the love of poetry in his personal experience, mm -hmm. and I found that very interesting mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and convincing. But what I was going to say was, and why I picked up my book was just to remind myself, and you referred to Coleridge's um, drawing the distinction between um, or, Distinguish without dividing. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and I found that very helpful when I mm. came across it. Yes. Because um, in the end, he's got a, a very whole view of a human person. Mm. You need to distinguish, mm. but you don't divide the whole person. Mm. And I, I find that that is embodied in the poetry. Mm -hmm. um, if I t particularly, you mentioned Frost at Midnight, which mm. I think is my, my favourite of, Me <laughs> of all his friends. Me too. And it's, it's wonderful. And mm. that bit in the middle where he talks about um, uh, God, um, eternal t nature, through nature. Yes. The, the, He's the talking about his, his baby, Hartley, his sleeping, sleeping but, infant babe, and God will be his great teacher, right. but, but through nature. The clouds nature. echo in their bulk, the hills, etc. That's right. The lovely shapes and sound intelligible of that eternal language mm. which thy God utters. Mm. So it's bringing um, nature and human consciousness together. Mm. Um, and I was interested in your aside about panpsychism, which mm. is sort of coming up to prominence again in yeah. in um, philosophical discourse which is and scientific discourse which I find very interesting and the, mm. uh, the other the other poem I particularly think of when um, I think of the whole person is dejection and ode mm. 
you know, where he talks about, and I just looked it up, it, oh lady, we, we receive but what we give, and in our life alone does nature live. Yes. And then he talks about, writes about joy, mm. a, a new heaven and a new earth. We in ourselves rejoice. Uh, can I just give myself the pleasure of reading that? Yes, please, 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 please. <laughs> and and us. Sorry. It's, it's it. Um, oh, lady, we but receive. We receive but what we give. The lady is the the, the love right. to whom who's mm. he's addressing himself. Mm -hmm. um, we receive but what we give, and in our life alone does nature live. Mm -hmm. Ours is her wedding garment. Ours her shroud. And would we ought behold of higher worth than that inanimate cold world allowed to the poor loveless ever anxious crowd ah from the soul itself must issue forth a light a glory a fair luminous cloud enveloping the earth mm. and from the soul itself must there be sent a sweet and potent voice of its own birth mm. of all sweet sounds the life and element i'll leave I'll leave a little bit Joy, virtuous lady, joy, that ne'er was given safe to the pure and in their purest hour. Life and life's effluence, cloud at once and shower. Joy, lady, is the spirit and the power which wedding nature to us gives in dower a new heaven and new earth, undreamt of by the sensual and the proud. Joy is the sweet voice, joy the luminous cloud. We in ourselves rejoice. And thence flows all that charms or ear or sight, mm. all melodies, the echo of that voice, all colours, a suffusion from that light. Mm. And I find it astonishing that in a poem, which is about dejection, mm. we get this extraordinary um, expression of, 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 of the innate joy of the soul. Yes which yes. he draws on in this And yet he says early, early in the poem, he says, I see not feel how beautiful they are. That's right, yes. And that, that, so, there's a heartbreaking, it's heartbreaking line. But, 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 and, but, but I find them joyous too, because he, in an intellectual and a rational sense, he sees beauty. He just doesn't yeah. feel it. There is a dejection. That is, that is, terribly beautiful in a sense aren't the senses and isn't the appreciation and isn't the intellectual sense too sharpened by you know being denied um the uh physical aesthetic pleasure that joy can give by being denied the swelling in the breast as it were by being denied yes. the palpitations and the swoony feeling um but still seeing uh the beauty it's uh, in a sense and, it and it's, that. that's right and writing this extraordinarily beautiful poem Yes, yes. But I, some people, but some people, I don't describe as, um, in a sense, his you know re regret at the loss of his imagination. But it's the most incredibly imaginative work. So it is. Yeah. It's such a paradox. And um, anyway, I, 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 my only comment on um, your, your talk was that in the poetry, in those extraordinary places, and indeed in the ancient mariner. He holds it all together. Yeah. Um, yes, holistically, and not dividing. Not dividing, yes. Very careful with his distinctions. Um, he's yes. been criticised as being scholastic sometimes in that sense. Um, and he read the scholastics a lot and, and, and appreciated that in them. Um, he loves making mm -hmm. his distinctions. He, he even yes. makes a distinction about distinctions. That's right. <laughs> versus yes. divisions. Yes, and then he holds it all together. Don't mm. divide. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. and that and that's that, that's that sense that that what I would call the the, the 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 romantic pattern which you also see in Yeats and we also see in Eliot and we of yes. of yes. returning to where you started from but 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 with a greater like the like the conversation poem itself having gone through all that you now where you began yes. you're higher in some sense or broadened or and repeating in Frost at Midnight repeating the language at the end yes. of the. Uh, the the frost the secret ministry secret ministry the frost um, performs the secret right ministry. beginning and end so it's yeah. the language is repeating as well and as that's the, the amplified chiasmus. thought that's the chiasmus there too you've, yes you've yes. gone through all of that and then you have the sensual beginning and you're now returning to that sensuality but it's now enlightened by reason 
Yes. Without disparaging yes. all of the meditation and the abstruser thoughts mm. in the middle. It is, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the unified mind. There. Well, the, 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 the abstruser thoughts in the middle, especially the reflections on what he, what, on his aspirations for Hartley, are mm. all part of the enlightenment by reason in, mm -hmm. in Coleridge's sense, aren't they? Yes. The, yes. the intuitive. Yes. Mm -hmm. The higher, higher reason, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, thank you. It's really nice to be, what made, did you want to re make revisit it? this. Thank you. Yes. Can I thank you for the uh, a very well researched and informative paper, and also Thanks, Barbara, Barbara for the um, the reading of the poems. Mm. I mean, those those poems, the early poems, are so wonderful. Mm. But I'm I'm afraid I'm a methodological naturalist, and I tend mm. to be I, I I get on people's nerves with my naturalism. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've also been zooming a, a program on on F. H. Bradley, the idealist, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and people have got so annoyed with my reductionist remarks mm. about idealism, which mm -hmm. is a naturalist or uh, that I've actually been excluded from the group. I'm sorry so to hear to that. I'm sorry to hear I that. Have to, I have to tread carefully, Raheem. Because I know I tread on people's toes all the time. I, out of kindness, the chairman of the group is going to allow me to sit in and hear what he said on the condition that I'm muted absolutely all through the discussion. Um, now, I thought that you, you underestimate the extent to which Coleridge's interest in metaphysics destroyed his poetic powers. Um, um, he kept writing, well, he, he wrote wonderful poetry um, for the rest of his well, life, um, beyond yes, dejection and know, node. To, 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 you know, here's a note that uh, House, in that wonderful little book, yep. you know, the Clark Lectures of mm -hmm. 1951, mm -hmm. on to have done with poetical prose, sickness, and some other worse afflictions first forced me into downright metaphysics. I believe that by nature I have more of the poet in me. Mm -hmm. So I think in Coleridge, rather than metaphysics, as it perhaps does in some poets, maybe mm. Milka and yes. reinforcing the poetic power destroys it. And also, well, okay, you, before, you continue, just, I mean, before you continue, just before you continue, just on. On that point, on that point, just to, to be point by point, um, in the second volume, immediately after his definition of the the definitions of the imagination at the end of um, volume one of Biographia, um, in the next volume, which is the first is philosophical, the second is, is literary critical. In um, the next chapter, chapter fourteen, the, which is as as it were, chapter one of volume two, he then goes on uh, to say that. Um, not all poems are poetry and not all prose is non-poetic and he actually believes that Plato has produced some of the greatest poetry ever written um, that though they are not in verse they are not poems um, and um, you can you can see very much um, um, and, and and he says as much in notebooks and letters that he um, that he in a sense he's given Wordsworth the job of the um, edif edifying poet, so he can continue with his poetic prose, um, which is often brilliant um, and uh, touching um, and contemplative, um, uh, which he continued um, and, until 1834. Um, so there's, n I, I wouldn't want that. <laughs> Coleridge himself um, said that there is that, that, there, that there is some of the highest poetry um, in certain um, um, moments in prose. Um, what I I thought, by the way, House's point that the best it's best to read the text of the dejection ode in the letter to Sarah rather, yeah. <coughs> rather yeah. than the text that Coleridge published. Mm. And I don't see how you can get round Peter. Yeah. For not to think of what I need, uh, needs must feel, that to be still and patient all I can, and happily, he, he seems to be partly endorsing this, but it's terrible, and happily, mm. by abstruse research, 
to steal from my own nature all the natural man. Now it's the natural man, not the Platonist and Platonistic man mm. that we must have. Mm -hmm. um, this was my sole resource, my wisest plan. Well, it was his unwisest plan. It destroyed mm. him. Mm -hmm. That which mm -hmm. apart, that is the intellect, mm -hmm. infects the whole and now is almost grown the temper of my soul. I mean, that shows the destructiveness of all this tinkering about with what goes, I mean, the great division in philosophy, I, I, don't, I don't like him because he's an idealist, but is Kant. And Kant mm. says we must stick within the bounds of sense. And all these pre-Kantian metaphysicians like Plato and Plotinus are always trying to take us on the, beyond the bounds of sense. And the only thing beyond the bounds of sense is nonsense. And in fact, you inspired me to write a poem. I completely disagree with you. I know you do. Plotinus. Oh, yeah, I completely Plotinus, disagree with you. Is that David? No, no, that's Mike. No, no, Mike. Oh, Mike uh, this, Go on then, Plotinus. Mike. Stop coming then, Mike. I mean, well, yeah. up, up to the boundary is interesting to you know that's where we are but i think beyond the boundary uh fulfills our curiosity as a as a you know why we're here as us you know as a spirit or, or, mm. or you know the curiosity of mankind using our mental faculty it's mm. about constantly to the boundary otherwise well, what's the point well, look, hey, you know, we might yeah, well just Mike, accept i think um, Ed, edward and mike i think the what Mike, what Mike just said there, it sounds like, okay, if, if Edward goes in the garden, he can say, here's a rose, here's a fence, here's some grass. Mike what might want to say, I'm alive. He mm. might want to say, well, wow, he might garden. want to enunciate and articulate that. But Edward would say, no, you can only say exactly what you see right now, because no, that's no, all there no, is no, naturalistically. No, no, yeah. that is, is, that, is that what you were saying, Mike? <laughs> well, I mean, I'd say that was part of it, but I'd also probably sort of think what was on the other side of the garden. Exactly, but there's one right. thing that you can't get to the other side. I mean, there's a, he Hegel has this sophism that you can't talk of a boundary unless you know what's at the other side of the boundary. Well, yeah, but we don't know where boundaries are until we've crossed over them. Oh, mm. that is not true. That is not true because death is a boundary that we cannot cross. Yeah, and no one's ever come back and tell Ed us anything Edward, what it's like. So how do we know what it's like? It's just, it's just our, our projection of our concept. Listen, That's all. listen Edward, everybody. Yes, this yes. is this is a point we will never get through by arguing with Edward. We've just got let Edward be on his own. No, and no, those no, of us who disagree will argue because it's not something that can be sorted by rational but, sense. You've got another point to raise. So, but but so Barbara, just, at least yeah. you, wouldn't, you wouldn't mute me, Barbara, would you? Um, no, I wouldn't mute you, but I wouldn't let you dominate either. Mm. Oh, no, I don't. No, no, I think everybody's got their place. Everyone, everything has got their these, expression. These, these mm. chaps are not going to let me dominate, Barbara. No, 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 all right. no, no I'm just, just saying it's, it's, it's not very helpful if we constantly get into the, an no. old rut that we can't get out of in argument. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. just to say, I, I want to ask oh, Edward a question. I want to ask yeah, Edward a question record, about... Oh, Edward, a question. Apart, mm. yes. What do you think about? I mean, you've heard that whole paper, which was about an hour or fifty minutes or so. Um, I mean, what do you, what do you, what, what, what do you think about um, the Coleridgean sense? And and forget about the theism. I I I I mentioned Iris Murdoch two or three times there yes. as a way for yes. naturalists to, in some sense, naturalists. To, to think about contemplation and ideas too. What, what do you think about this idea of meditation um, tapering off, as it were, into contemplation? Do you have moments of contemplation? And I don't, I don't mean thinking through things, you know, and, 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 and using propositions and wrangling oh. and all of that. I just mean a kind of an intuitive sense. Because I believe uh, the great naturalists, I honestly believe that the great naturalists um, are contemplative, the great ones, not necessarily Richard Dawkins or... Um... No, that's a good question, mm. Edward. Yes, no, I do. I often write poems about, I mean, I wrote one about a, a magpie a, a strutting a, like a cock a, a, across the lawn, you know. Mm. I often see which lead to meditation and so on. But mm. I don't uh, think that this is anything... You see, what, what appalled me, I, I don't want... I know, I just forgive me, but this is what I wrote. Mm. Uh, this is the yes, please. Plotinus, you have much to answer for. 
mm -hmm. poor drunk Coleridge with his opium, conceived your Enneads were like a door to the mystical Elysium. But what ideas are, he couldn't say, and how their world connected with the flesh. He only felt they carried him away to freedom from the body's mesh. They lifted him to sovereign reason's realm, above the understanding's lowly climb, where an ecstatic trance would overwhelm and raise him from the world of time. Then suddenly eternity would shrink. The blank page stare him once more in the face, and he was in the world of pen and ink, a drunkard and disgrace. Where was the time when Wordsworth at his side, he strode through woods and fields consumed with joy, but youth with all its hopes does not abide. Time makes a wreck of many an ambitious boy. Then mystic dreams replaced accomplishment and sage Plotinus brews an anodyne which earthlier substances may complement when laudanum is added to the wine. Did you, did, did you write that in about five minutes? I'm sorry? Did you write that in about five minutes just now? No, I wrote it five minutes at 7.30 this morning. Oh, that's very, 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 very talented indeed. I'm very impressed. Uh, our poetry just comes to me in the morning. A, a line comes at 7.30 most mornings and I sit down and mm -hmm. just write off. Mm. Did, did William have a point? Um, no, it's very uh, fascinating um, uh, to see this all put into a context by someone who's thoroughly uh, researched it. Thanks. How about Ursula? Um, yeah, no, thank you for that. It was wonderful. It was it was such a treat to listen to something so rich. Um, I just wondered, um, you talked about ideas and you talked about the imagination and you referred to Plato and images, and was there a correlation between the imagination and the ideas for Coleridge? Definitely, yes, definitely. Um, um, that's, and in fact, I, 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 I hope I said as much um, uh, that there, there, there was the, um, a, um, a kind of a harmony, so that ideas and images rhyme explicitly for Coleridge, um, there's a sort of a semantic rhyme going on there. They're both intuitive, you know. Um, images are an intuitive connection um, with the world right out there um, and with the laws that give them shape um, and, um, you know, the, the laws that give the magpie shape, the rose shape, the, the rain, it's, you know, patterns, etc. cetera. Um, the, our imagistic um, relation to that um, is often um uh, for for plato uh the imagistic relation to that is 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 what he says almost literally fascinating in the bad sense of the word of 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 you know the prisoners in the cave being tied and shackled and bound to the images like sometimes i worry my 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 6 year old daughter might be fascinated by what's on the ipad or <laughs> for a bit too long um that that sort of negative sense of that 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 bind to the flowing patterns uh, whereas for Coleridge, he too was worried about what he thought the mazy, the mazy um, meandering paths of simply what we call today going with the flow of just observing, of being, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a famous book which I don't like at all. I haven't even, you know, read very much into it, but a friend gave it to me. Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. Yeah. And he talks about always, I know who he is. always be in now, always go with the flow. If, if that happened, there would be no such thing as families, for example. There'd be no such thing as getting anything done. Because you, if you're always following that impulse, if you're honest just to yeah, that, that moment. Um, right. And Coleridge, of course, you know, from his own... Yeah, Carl, Carl, you know, the one you're talking about, The Power of Now. Yeah. It's, um, you know, they're, they're just, all, the, all these types of books are just sort of, they're, they're pointers. They're not to be taken literally oh, know, yes, as yes. though that's the Bible. And right. Yes, yes. Guides the fire of the imagination, so you know yes. which direction, mm -hmm. you know which you're interested in. Right. Okay. Um, so, but that, 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 I, I that as a point anyway, to say that Coleridge was worried about the the maziness of association theory, and if that if that is the pinnacle of what the human mind is, this going with the flow, this this passive this passivity of the human mind. Um, 
and yet uh, to answer um I've forgotten your question, Ursula. Ursula, to answer Ursula's question, yeah. um, for Coleridge, more than much more than Plato, in in a sense, in here opposed to Plato, he saw in the images a kind of mirror image reflection of the ideas, um, in a similar sort of way that Goethe saw, could see, or thought that he might be able to see, and then a sort of way that Francis Bacon also thought one may be able to, by induction, look at particular phenomena, and eventually get towards. Um, the laws behind them, um, P and yeah. So Peter, Coleridge, can I just was one of those, Coleridge was one of those people. I mean, um, who, who 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 thought that with kind of an obsessive uh, observation of the flowing of the patterns of water as he walks along the River Tees or the Ouse or something like that, um, that that he could actually get to some kind of um, phenomenological heart. Of 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 the way of existence. He, he he really believed that careful attention to the imagery of nature and how it works would go beyond, as it were, the phenomena, what he called the natura naturata, or nature natured as fixed dead items in a corpuscular universe, and get more into a kind of spinozistic natura naturans or nature naturing, the intrinsic nature, the living nature, as it were. Um, beyond the, the just, you know, the, the fixed bodies bumping into each other that are passive. And he believed that this careful attention, the poetic and philosophic attention to images um, could actually take one uh, to um, mm. ideas. Um, yeah, but which is something that Plato that, explicitly said he couldn't yeah. do. Mm. Peter, can and I just in follow that, in, those, in, in those notebooks, mm. it's, it's very interesting how, following on what you said, Peter, Every now and then, he has a bit of angst about the many and the one. How can yep. he hold the one with the many of, mm. of phenomena? Mm -hmm. And he's, he's always sort of mm. caught trying to hold both. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yes, of course. And yes. I, I, I find that moving, the mm. way he's really... Mm. In a sense, yes. he's experiencing the philosophical knot in his yes. own being. Mm -hmm. mm. He has an, I just like him as, a, as, a, as having an omnicomprehensiveness. Um, and they can understand that emotionally too, as, as relating to what you said about his poetry. He wants to hold the whole together and he can yes, never disparage yes. the many for the one. And he can never, That's right. but of course he will not also disparage the one for the many. And that no. is in a sense our lot and our task and our joy too. Um, and even when yes. we are debarred from that, um, there's a joy as, as, as we see, in dejection anode, because you can see, not feel the beauty. Um, and even mm -hmm. that being excluded in the sense, I don't think Moses felt sorry if he ever existed. I don't think Moses felt sorry because he couldn't walk into the promised land. That's sometimes how I think about, um, he could see it, but oh, not right. live in it. Um, I think about well, dejection in that, in that way. Peter, Peter, some of the loveliest passages uh, in Wordsworth and Coleridge mm. are the pantheistic ones. I mean, I think, but Barbara knew it, quoted them, some of them, mm -hmm. uh, about the same one with, uh, with nature and so on. Now, yeah, it seems you might be thinking of the Aeolian the the harp. In the Aeolian harp, he does give that very well, famous, well, oh, the one life not, within us and abroad passage. Yes, that, that, is, that is a salient passage. And, but and, also, and, 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 and it's, a, it's a, these bubbles that, that rise and glitter and they burst. Um, and yeah. I, I was thinking also of the many passages in the Prelude, where Wordsworth's yes. um, intimacy with uh, nature is, is so forcefully. Brought. Now, it yes. seems to me that philosophically, mm. um, there's a huge gap <laughs> between Spinoza's pantheism mm. and Platonism, mm. because Spinoza is a monist in a very strict sense. He believes mm. that there is only this world. It was not created. Mm. It always was and always will be. Of course, yeah. he identified with God. That's that's his form. And of yet, theism. he's a dualist in the dual aspect sense of that um, substance, which well, is Deus Jiva Natura, God or nature, is, and it has. Yes, but the, the the thing about kind of Platonist, Plotinist, um, um dualism, mm. it it is a dualism. You know. It's true we have the, the two aspects. Yeah, well, you, you, you could possibly argue that, and, and quite well for Plato. I don't think you could argue that um, for Plotinus, for whom everything was, in a sense, stacked like, you know, those Matryoshka dolls, those Russian nesting dolls. Yes. I mean, he, 
about the flight of the alone to the alone. That's right. Now, yes, where, yes. now where is this other alone? The other alone is in some transcendental world. No, it's not. It's already here. There's nothing, there's nothing outside that. It's like, it's trying to like wrap your head around Parmenides. It's a similar sort of thing. If well, all there is, we, is this plenum, then okay, you're already there. Peter, what are we flying from then? If everything's already here, why do we have to fly? Why do we have a flight from the world to this other world where we will be one with the unknown? It's, it's another dimension on this world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's well, a dimension. No, it's a dimension proper. of experience. That, that is a very interesting view, Barbara, but I'm not sure it's Plotinus's view. I, oh, sorry, I don't, I don't know if it's Plotinus's view. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's my view. Plotinus. <laughs> and I... Is, is very famous for using the Greek word, you know, hoyon, uh, as it were, and ev everything he says. I mean, I, I, at one point he apologizes for, for saying, I should be saying, as it were, after every second or third word, as it were, I should, I, as it were, should, as it were, well, be, well, as it were. This, I mean, this is a common ten, uh, tendency among mysticism, you know, I yeah. can't quite say, I can't quite say, I can't quite get, I, 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 I can't articulate this, it's beyond the articulable. No, it's like it depends, it depends, with, it depends with whom they are talking. If they are talking to a naturalist, then every time they open their mouth and the naturalist spits into it, then they have to be saying, I can't quite say. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, Spinoza is a naturalist. And uh, mm. according to Spinoza, mm. there, is, there is no transcendental realm of being. There is only one realm of being, and it's the totality of things. Yeah, but that, that, there's no right and wrong, Edward. There's no right and wrong. Spinoza has his idea. Same mm. as everybody's got their own idea. You know, it's, it's no right and wrong. It's just an acceptance of where we are, where we're at. And, and going back to this idea about boundaries, boundaries are, for example, like, um, you know, we've got this body. It yeah. has its limits. It has its, like, cell by date. We, we're all going to die one day. So, you know, but within that, we've got the ability to comprehend concepts, you know, to make poems, to express ourselves, to absorb yeah. the beauty of the world around us and to give back to it. It's, you know, it, it's like, you know, boundaries aren't, they're man-made concepts. Ma it's Mike, like what, Mike, Mike what do you make? Mike, what do you make of the difference between conceptual thought, that sort of meditation, as in, as in Descartes and Cartesian kind of meditations, what do you think of the difference between conceptual thought and the possibility of passing over into contemplation? I mean, have you, have you had any moments that you consider contemplative in that still, non-discursive sense? And what do you make of it? Very interesting. Um, I, I should say Mike's yeah, an artist. All, sorry. Okay. Mike's an artist. Thanks for telling me that helps. Well, I paint. I mean, we all we've all sort of made decisions about what sort of life we're going to lead. You know, what sort yeah. of paths we're on. And I think I do inhabit a uh, space. You know, probably a bit more so than you know, sort of most people because I spend more time doing it. Is, is looking, uh, you know, and and trying to sort of push the boundaries mm -hmm. and you know trying to absorb in order to in order to express it so um uh contem contemplation you know it's not you know you said something very interesting um i can't remember exactly the word you used but you said something like we can contemplate a concept but we can't comprehend it yeah that's right yeah quite we can apprehend so, it but we can't contem co comprehend it we yeah can, we, so can't it's like a draw a line idea, around it's it it's very much in the mind but to mm. comprehend stuff it's without the mind. It's it's like tabula yeah. rasa. Mm -hmm. it, it's this, you know, it's like comprehending a feeling. It's all to do with, in a way, it's, it's, it's your heart having a connection with, with mm -hmm. the other side of the boundary. The comprehension it, is a mind thing, which you realize there's a boundary, there's a thing, it's a practical thing, but it's not an aesthetic thing. Mm -hmm. The boundary, you know, the, 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 when you use the term boundary, you're, you are using a concept, the concept. Yeah. Yeah, all word, words are concept if you want to take it. Yes, but I can't understand Peter's. I mean, what is a con concept? Concepts enable us to talk to each other. That's because right. Because concepts generate language. Yes. Now, yes. what would it be to purely contemplate? I mean, I can imagine contemplating a vase yes. a, 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 or, or a bowl of flowers and perhaps making a poem out yes. of it as Rilke did. I mean, Rilke con con contemplated and made a symbol out of the rose, didn't he? Mm -hmm. he, re, he re, I mean, the rose is, a, is an age-old poetic symbol, 
and, and yeah. Wilke found new ways of talking okay, about Okay, I, I, I understand your point and, 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 and I think I understand your question. So for example, oh, let me think, imagine, oh, some, imagine, you know, Kierkegaard's um, Eastfeet, who, you know, he's a seducer, a serial seducer, and he, and, and, and like Mozart's Don Juan, etc. he hurts um, usually women um, by pleasing um, himself in very physical and literal ways. And there's a possibility um, that Kierkegaard says, for example, that such a person, such an aesthete, could, um, by something like contemplation of what personality, what it means to be a person is, that could, that, 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 it's through, through, through contemplation of purposes, of one's higher purposes, um, beyond um, pleasing myself, um, that um, brings one into the moral beyond the aesthetic, beyond the merely natural. What you're talking about is not contemplation, it's further reflection. <clears throat> he may, for example, mm -hmm. see the unhappiness he's caused to a girl he's seduced. Now well, that brings a pure, in a pure naturalist aesthete need not care for that. Why should he? And, and further reflection implies further thought. Yeah. But oh, contemplation, yeah. contemplation is not the same as thought in my book. That's correct, yes, yes. It's a much more... Certainly not discursive uh, thought. Yes, it's a word, it is a wordless place. Mm -hmm. It can end up with poetry, but mm -hmm. it, the, the experience of contemplation is, mm -hmm. is, yeah. is still... As I was saying, you reach up to wordless. it, but then the poet's job is to bring it down and articulate it conceptually. But you can't That's get right. there from the concept alone. The, the, the job of the, the concept is like the brick, and you can't make a house yeah. with just bricks. You need a blueprint, you need a purpose, you need a frame. Um, yes. And the job of the poet, like the job of the historian and so on, is to put into words what you have seen. Houses, um, and that are, having... houses are not made by contemplation. Well, in a, in a, sense, no, they, in a sense, they, they are, are when you understand the purposes of different spaces. <laughs> I mean, it depends. What, if, if, if you're just a Barrett home cookie cutter kind of architect, then, then perhaps I might agree with you. Hmm. But it's to bring, it, the way the, the poet would be the same as the architect is that they're bringing vision into form. Yeah. Articulating it, literally. Yes. With the yes. concept. The concept is not being disparaged. The concept of the understanding, it's not being disparaged here. It's the, or it's always the necessary mediator. It's in a sense, the love in the sense of communication, like Plato's contemplative had to be almost forced or at least asked very sternly, please go back and educate, as it were, the prisoners in the cave. Don't just sit in the island of the blessed. Come back and articulate. Uh, it's a famous story about St. Thomas Aquinas. After he'd written the whole summa, um, he, he hmm. then had some kind of contemplative vision for the first time and couldn't write another thing. He said, all of my writings are just straw. Well, Plato would have said to him, no, write that down. Try to. There's nothing ineffable. You can actually try to well, certainly Coleridge would have said, there's nothing ineffable. You, you try your damnedest to put that into words. And if you can't use literal words, you use images and symbols. You're, you're, I mean, you're, you're alternating, Peter, between de defending the ineffable, because you've just quoted Coleridge as saying, we must avoid the ineffable, we must say. Yes. And, and Our people, job I'm, is to articulate as much as is possible. There might be, okay, there might be praise, moments. But then you praise Aquinas. For 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 um for that, I find, way, I find that Aquinas remark a, another example. But I know I know Barbara's going to of, of of a false humility on the part of a Christian. All I've you know when a chap says all I've written, all the thousands of words I've written are worthless. We know he doesn't believe a word of it. He well, thinks the point is he didn't write any more. After well, uh, he said that and didn't write uh, anything. So that is something. He didn't add to that pile of stuff. I know, but maybe he was just worn out. I mean, the, the summer is such a, a tremendous... Uh, I agree with you. I agree with you, Edward. It is very possible that he was maybe just worn out. I do agree with you. Somebody should put a footnote there. And, and to pretend that he held it was worthless is a false modesty. No, but when you say pretend, then you're interpreting, and not everyone's going to agree with your interpretation of Aquinas's state of mind when he said it. No. There's no naturalistic evidence that he to... was just pretending, I think. 
but that's okay. endemic to the human condition. We're always interpreting and we may misinterpret. Yeah, I know. So yes. it brings exactly. you back to, to motives, doesn't it? What provokes people to do what they do, to say what they say? Yeah, you, know, you could just say with Aquinas, it's a, it's a way of talking. It might have been exaggerating in order to make a point. People do it all the time. But there is still a point there that I think you can perceive. Well, I mean, the puzzling thing, what, what, what is so emotionally moving, the great puzzle is, is music, isn't it? Now, that, what is music's relation to the conceptual? It's just one of the music, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't seem, you can't mm. write a poem without syntax, grammar and semantics. But it's still bringing vision into form, because yeah. music is form. Yes. Yeah. With, with rules. Yeah. Yes. I, I think one of the puzzles yeah. might be if we imagine that concepts are only there when words are there. Right. There is for sure an interplay between our use of language mm -hmm. and the development of our concepts. Mm -hmm. Yes. But in another sense, in a very real sense, the concepts come first. Yes. Well, yes, I've seen children. And know. therefore the there are concepts without feeling, language. The concept is a way of understanding the feeling. Surely feelings come first. Well, it did. It, 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 ah. Here I am at a loss to know what people mean by concepts, because I would have, I would regard a feeling as a concept too, but I know this is not fashionable. Well, it kind of more when we're just talking about logic, concepts and language and why music would be a mystery, yeah. well, music's only a mystery if you think that concepts, including emotions and feelings, Must be can only be expressed in language. With grammar, yes. yes. Uh, if you extend but, 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 the concept of language the broadly there. enough, then music becomes language. Then that would be true. But of course, still mm. we understand, and then we express. So I think, yeah, and then we understand more. Yeah. When, you you the the understand. Uh, when you say when you say concept is a feeling, of course, we have the concept of love. We have the concept of longing. We have the concept of nostalgia. But, you know, those are all feelings. I mean, if one might possibly nice. think, we might think, um, we might think of, of concepts as a kind of rebus, you know, of a correspondence idea of communication where this word or this term or this note or this chord or this colour or this interplay of colours stands for this, that, this, that. Not necessarily in a strict way, if the context changes and the meaning of each of those pieces changes oh. too. And therefore conceptuality can be understood as a rebus. And in that sense, feelings too, although I think Wittgenstein disagreed, but feelings too could act with the concepts as concepts. Um, did that make sense? Well, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's an eternal dance between those two poles. There's an eternal? Dance between the two poles, between yeah. the, the concept and the thought. Yeah. I mean, not the, sorry, not the concept, the feeling. And the, uh -huh. uh, and the thought. The, mm -hmm. the feeling and the, 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 the thought, whatever it is, the experience, let's say. Yeah, mm -hmm. and yeah the, the logic form, and the heart. I and, and the way it's expressed, whether it's language, words, or music notes, there's, mm -hmm. like, yeah. like you said, there's a constant interplay or dance. Absolutely, nice yeah, word. regardless of the expression. It's those two that. And so that gives us two levels capacity. of what people like Coleridge said there were three of. There's the feeling. There's the concept, there's that eternal dance. There's also something else which is objectively real and discoverable, which is, we might put it in another term, which is the possibility, which some people like scientists and artists and historians and creative people discover in the same way that you can, in a sense, hit upon a concept or a way of putting something. You can also discover a new possibility, which can then broaden your conceptual space. Um, well, a good example of that is Einstein with the concept of simultaneity. He changed right. that concept of simultane simultaneity. I'm sure Rahim could. I've got another example of that, and it's a physical one. But you can have a man and a woman creating a baby. You create a third thing, don't you? It's like, you know, that's what happens. Yes. Yeah, you know, that's why the three is a magic, magical number, I suppose. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But, like, I... you know, sorry. No, sorry. Mm -hmm. No, but it's I not thought, just a, yeah, it's a third thing, which is a different thing, which is related to the two. I mean, it's dialectic. I yeah. think the danger is reification. And, 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 and this owes a lot to Plato, of course, because he was searching for definitions all the time. That is, you... Ah, but Edward, he was searching for... Socrates was searching, was, was pushing with his Elenchus 
for definitions in order to bring people to throw their hands in the air and say, actually, I don't know what I thought I knew. Well, and then they get yeah. that thirst for knowledge. Oh, there's an emptiness now in the, in the shape of what I thought I knew. I must now try and suck myself, as it were. But often or, because the brain abhors a vacuum just like nature. Uh, often, you're, you're, I, I mentioned the pastiche of Plato, and I think you're, you're, you're being a bit of a, you're giving a bit of a pastiche of Plato right now. No, I'm not. I mean, you know, if, you, if you, Plato will take a concept like courage, right, he will engage with his interlocutors, and they will all give him examples of what courage is, you know, like General so-and-so did this on this battlefield, yep. so-and-so yep. did that. Plato, and then Socrates stands back and says, oh, You've given me lots of examples. Yeah. But what I want to know is what courage is. Yes. Well, there is nothing beyond the examples. I mean, that is a, a prize example of reification. He thinks there's something beyond particular. And this is where Wittgenstein corrected him. Wittgenstein uh, well, I, I, I don't know. I think any naturalist scientist will say that you should be able to define your terms and your genera and your kinds. Well, you can. H2O is a, is, 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 is a cast iron definition of water. The I definition mean, I, is, Edward, definition is not reification. Quite, quite right. No, well, I'm, I'm not saying the Well, I mean... You did. You just said that a few minutes ago. I mean, Chris, I'm not attacking definition. I'm attacking Plato's misuse of the idea of definition in the Socratic dialogues, where he takes on people who give him examples, and he says, I don't want examples. I want a definition of courage. Well, I, I think it is a fair point that you can give as many examples as you like. You still haven't given a, a definition that will apply to different examples. Yeah. So you might say, this man is courageous, this man is courageous, this woman is courageous, this dog is courageous. Now you come across another man, that hasn't told you yes. whether this other man is courageous until you've got the general concept. I think in that dialogue, the, the, general, I I think that dialogue the, gen, the general, whose name I forget, but the general was saying... Legacy, yes, thank you. Was that courage is keeping to your position? Yeah, not abandoning, the, not abandoning your comrades. Yeah, That's but then he keeps shifting... The, he keeps shifting it when you find counter examples of people who are still courageous. And his point is, Lakey's actually says, ah, that counter example, oh yeah, he might have abandoned his comrades, but he's still courageous. What Socrates is getting at here is that there is an intuition beyond just what you can express in your normal discourse of what courage is. He's being myutic, you know that. You know that Socrates is saw himself as a midwife and you know that he's not simply playing some barrister's game here he's not just lawyering he's trying to get people in a, in a in a kind of in a kindish kind of way but but it looks like like he's making them look like fools he's trying to show them in a kind enough way their own ignorance in a certain sense that but that ignorance in their discourse is is far more ignorant than the ignorant than than the, than the knowledge which is in which is not fully developed than the really knowledge of what they in fact do already know in some incipient way. The general does know that this counterexample shows that his previous example was not sufficient. Socrates is trying to pull out like a baby from him what courage really is. All you're saying is there is a, there is a multiplication of, of, of particular particularities. There are certain kinds of courage we may not realise and we may not have no. met. That does not justify the notion that there is a, such a thing as courage in itself. There is no such thing as courage in itself. There are only examples of courage. I, I, examples. I, I think that's um, I think that's true to a certain extent but in a certain context, Edward. That we not many people would go along with the idea that there is this platonic form of courage which is somehow more real That's than true. than people being courageous mm. um, but that it, it, again we're talking here about looking at the concept of courage we entered this little avenue of yeah. discussion by talking about concepts you mm. can talk about the concept of courage and what Ar aristotle really uh, sorry what um socrates is doing here really plato develops this theory of forms which we won't go along with but some mm -hmm. is really saying actually you know how to use this word yeah but mm. you don't know how to describe how you use it that's right that's you put it very and, well and this seems to be a little more relevant to what peter was presenting actually 
Yes, we are often at a it's loss. It's knowing something without being able to put it into words. Mm. Yes, we're often at a loss to, to articulate some things, but that doesn't, well. No. I suppose yeah. they got the character in the Bible, you know, Doubting Thomas. Mm. You've got to have characters like that. Like Winnie the Pooh is made. You've got Eeyore and you've got Piglet and you've got all these different types of characters. Yes, mm. but Socrates... You know what I mean? It's like human nature is very much part of that. And, and some yeah, people are more like that. That's, that's a whole debate, actually. Yes. Uh, we we, we yeah. can have a whole session on on the Socrates. universals and particulars. Mm. I just want to bring up... David Clough got a point. Because he wrote me a long email uh, prior to the meeting. So maybe some points, David. I haven't got a lot to say, actually, um, because I think the reason I haven't leapt to Peter's defence is that, for me, Berm is a bit of a barrier. I mm. don't find him easy. Mm -hmm. um, and that affects you and Barbara as well, actually. Um, but, I mean, I mean, the general thing was I was just trying to position where Peter was coming from within the Coleridge debate, really. That was my, my main reason for the comments I made at the beginning of the meeting and one or two others at the beginning. But I knew it would be difficult because I'm not fully engaged with the sort of hammer and tongs debate going on here, really. I mean, I am more Kantian in the end because mm -hmm. people like Recur are more Kantian, I suppose. But there were touches of Recur, Berglin, William Desmond, all sorts of thinkers who are certainly in this sort of area. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm interested in what Peter's been saying throughout the meeting. I think that's Berglin, answer. I think, didn't he talk about being broken? I can't remember where I read it. Um, well, from, from um, in, in in one of his works of philosophical anthropology, be, uh, of of being broken headed uh, was 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 some kind of concept he was talking about in the thing I. He's certainly very interested in Plato. I'll, get, I'll start there, but he's very interested in Plato. But I he think was, the um, mm. the new the, the you know the the noetic and all these sort of things yes. are very important. Um, uh, mm -hmm. But really, I don't have a I don't really have a question because I can't go quite all the way with you. But I am is mm -hmm. very interested. I'd be interested to know where you differ, for example, with Tim Fulford or with the other scholars I mentioned at the beginning, because there presumably are differences. And mm -hmm. Headley's work that I've, I've read three of his books, but, but they're quite, the one that you've listed is 2000. It's in historical terms, it's quite ancient, well, not ancient, but it's kind of, it's the millennial yeah. sort of book, isn't it? Um, mm -hmm. And I wondered whether you felt, even with these figures, they were, if you like, trap like me in a slightly more rationalistic position than you might want Headley to Headley certainly isn't. Know. He's one of the few people um, I know who is a, a thoroughgoing Neoplatonist. Yes, yes, yes. There aren't many around, I know. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. And it's admirable. But like. actually, most Neoplatonist scholars are, if you scratch them, Neoplatonists themselves. It's very interesting, that. Yes, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Really, I, don't, I, I mean, I did raise the issue of apophatic the, the yep. sort of Jewish mosaic sort of yep. aspect to the, the, the I am question. of Philo. You haven't really talked about the I am question in your final talk. You did in the chapter that you send out. I said not, in the end note that this talk has not done justice to the breadth of topics and available material, etc. That's right, et that's right. Mm. Yeah. Um, as, you, as, get, as, you yeah. mentioned Kierkegaard and Heidegger, Kierkegaard, all these people I know more about than, mm -hmm. than probably uh, Berm, put it that way. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. So there you have a point. Yeah, no, I was just, um, Peter, originally I was hoping to strike up a dialogue about this kind of correlation between idea and image. images, imagination, and you said it strikes new ideas. But I'm By the way, are you coming from art or philosophy or literature or generally? Yeah, what I'm, um, well, I suppose what's interesting is listening to everyone speak today mm -hmm. and talking about the notion of concepts and language. It, it kind of strikes me that we all talk in visionary terms. Um, like Mike was saying, he, he um, watches things constantly. Someone else said about the vision of the architect. You said about Socrates was trying to show us something. Mm. And, and I wonder, you know, in this whole notion of, we're talking about definitions, like the definition of imagination, mm. how Helen Keller, who never has seen in her life, mm. uh, was still able to write a book about imagination, but would, would never have seen images mm. Mm. Um, to give her these kind of correlations or new ideas so no it's just that's what I was kind of just thinking aloud I mean it's a different mm -hmm. debate for a different day but I suppose I'm fascinated in the terms of our understanding that we're constantly pulling on visual language mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. The reason for that, surely, is because the visual sense is the one that gives us the most information about the world. Yep. Um, as, as any naturalist will tell you, it take the, 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 the visual cortex takes up a great deal of this of, of the cortex too. Um, um, Coluge went so far as to say at some point that he actually prefers, especially when talking about contemplation, to use the sensory metaphor of listening more than mm. seeing. Mm. He believes mm. in his phrase that there is a despotism of the eye. And again, he's not disparaging sights. Sights are lovely, mm. you know, but there's a despotism in that all, even linguistically, I see what you mean, etc. cetera. Um, mm. um, our, our metaphors are, you know. Um, yeah, well, I suppose, what, what it was part of the animal that we are. A dog would be smelling. I smell what you're saying. I smell where yeah. you're coming from, you know. No, I suppose what I was trying to do is the difference between kind of, if you look at the Oxford Dictionary, mm -hmm. it will say that the ima imagination equates to images. Um, yeah. But the imagination is much more than images, and that That's was Helen right. Keller's argument. I mean, a good, a good, good definitions usually say that it's actually sent, uh, the, the, the aestheticization of some symbol or form or thought or mm. idea, um, you know, so it can be communicated. In a sense, you know, the, 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 the stained glass windows or the Bible or, or that sort of thing. It's, it's a putting into imagery, um, but, it, but it, does, it doesn't have to But be, you need to know what a stained glass window looks like. Well, of course, there's a grammar um, to every, to every language. Image. Yes, there's a grammar to every language, yeah. whether it's in words or not, yes. Yeah, well, image you know goes back to place or like copying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it goes back to places like copying, but I'm thinking more of the richer imagination that can't pull on copying an image. And that was kind of the work Helen Keller did, but it, it's a, another debate for another day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, well, for, Peter, yeah, for, yeah, for, for, for giving for, us the for, talk. For Coleridge there, well, just to get again back to Ursula, for, for, for Coleridge there, the, 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 um, the salient point about the imagination is, again, it's not, it's not nearly mimetic. That, that would be what would be the lowest kind of fancy. Um, it actually, you know, it, 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 it's, it's in a sense all chemical. It changes and um, transfuses and um, you know, it, it's, um, it combines to create a third of the thing to, to pick up on what Mike was saying, mm. you know. Um, um, it, it doesn't, so fancy just puts things two together and it's additive. Um, imagination, in a sense, you might want to say is productive. It doesn't produce a sum or an aggregate. It, it gives produce, a living produce. And that's why he thinks imagination is a living power and not just a mechanical. You know, throughout my mm. paper, there's the, the difference between the mechanical understanding and the enlightened one. And I'm not sure if that, that is, 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 is fully, you know, I, I didn't really speak to that. I just hope mm. that people would pick up on it. But yeah, the, the yes. fancy what, is, what's it? Mm -hmm. I was just thinking of those, those lines Beware, beware, his flashing eyes, his floating hair. <laughs> Weave a circle round him thrice, and close your eyes with holy dread. For he on honeydew hath fed, and drunk the milk of paradise. There, imagination, mm. it's, it's uh, indescribable. Mm. And it's, you can build it's the castle there if you just have the music. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit scary. It's a bit scary. <laughs> <That's great>. <laughs> Mm -hmm. well, yeah. Whatever, whatever Coldridge is described, it sounds great. Mm. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Peter. For thank you, Rahim. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks very much, Rahim. Peter. Yes. Thank you. And thanks course, a million. That was fantastic. It's really excellent. Yeah. We hope what about, to have another session. Yes, Sorry, please, really. please let, let me know what's going on uh, with other with other conversations. Although it's a bit late for me. Um, if whoever, oh, if ever, whoever, I was going to say, if whoever's recording this can send it to me, but I think I'm recording it myself. I'm not sure. You, you, you recorded are. it, Peter. Ah, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. thank, and Edward, thank you. Uh, your poem's great. Really good. Mm. Thank you. Uh, thank well, you very much. Bye bye. Well, thanks, Edward. Yeah. Thank you. Next Thank week. you all. Thanks, Raheem. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye. Bye. Right. Bye. Sleep well, Peter. Thank you. <laughs> Good night. Oh, hi. Is that David Clough? <laughs> I was He's going to hear me, but I can't see you. But you, yeah. You I was going to mention on a technical note. Oh. Um, I've had another email from Zoom. At one okay. time, they threatened that we would have to use a password, and they've threatened that again. So, um, if there is a need to change the way you join, I will send an email to Rahim and he will send it out to everyone. Just watch out for that. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank, Thank you. you. Goodbye. Bye.